This is Your Pain Game Podcast, where we talk about the game of living in and with chronic pain and trauma, getting to the heart of how to heal. I am your host, Lindsay Soprano. On the show, I plan on discussing with doctors, chronic pain patients, holistic practitioners, loved ones, and anybody that is interested in having their voice heard in the chronic pain and trauma world that we live in. Each time that I prep for an episode um, for this little love child of mine, I'm in awe at how I get to meet people from all over the world that are here to share their stories so that they might be able to help another person, right? And I find this whole show so incredibly fulfilling and I'm continuously finding my so much gratefulness in this process and for all of you that come on the show and for all of my VIP listeners as well. And I have to say that it's not easy when you live in chronic pain, getting out of bed every day. And with my CRPS, you know, man, oh man, I I talk to my feet in the morning. I'm like, Thelma and Louise, come on, babies. We got to do another day. Got another day ahead of us, right? And quite honestly, it's gotten to the point though, when I wake up, the first thing I think about is the show. And the last thing I think about is is the show. (laughs) Yes, sweetie, you're in there somewhere too. But I'm wanting to get out of bed for you guys. And it's such a cool feeling. But I do have to remind myself that during this process, I do have to be mindful of caring for myself as well and to not get lost in all of the hubbub of of doing something like this because it is a lot of work. And everybody that podcasts and my guests also has a podcast as well. And you know, we get lost um, sometimes in life. And it's easy to do, especially when you've dealt with trauma and live in chronic pain. And my guest today was pretty lost when traditional medicine continued to fail her after diagnosis, after diagnosis, just kept rolling in, not only with fibromyalgia and she had slipped and bulging discs and this unrelenting chronic nerve pain and weakness in her limbs. She also has CRPS. So I'm like, oh my God, there's just another one of us out there, right? It sounds like quite the party. (laughs) So she decided that it was time to face a few things that had happened to her when she was young and take on the trauma head on with all the gusto in the world. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my guest today, Katie Wrigley. Hi, Katie. Hi, Lindsay. So I wanted to get talking a little bit about you. You're a transformational coach with a specialty in pain and stress. Yes. And you're also a Cogno movement practitioner. I can't wait to get into that because it's really cool. And you came into this niche pretty organically because of the stuff that you've been through in your life and you're ready to face some, some traumas head on. So I'd kind of like to start there about, well... Facing, you know, looking at ourselves in the mirror and being brave about coming, coming into our own with some of the things that have happened to us is it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard work. <laughs> it is. It is. And full disclosure, because that's the way I like to roll. I had had a suspicion this trauma had happened to me. I guess technically it's a repressed trauma, even though whenever the topic of repressed traumas come up in school, like in psychology class or something, I always thought back to the people who had abused me. They'd always come into mind. And I'd even asked my mom at one point, like, did they do anything to me? She's like, no, they were your favorites. And now I understand, now that I've gone back into my subconscious, I understand why she thought they were my favorites. They, they were not. But anyway, I finally, I had done a San Pedro ceremony with my coach. So this was mm, about two or three months as I started to get back to life after being disabled. So I'd barely gotten out of my house. I didn't really have any friends. Like my coaches were pretty much the only people I really let close to me and they were far away. (laughs) So I had no one like locally close to me, but she had come out and we had this amazing ceremony. And I actually went back to like in utero in my mom's belly, remember conversations. And when I came out of that ceremony, it's like, okay, I have a repressed memory and it's time to do ayahuasca. And the, and the reason I call this up, psychedelics actually have an amazing healing effect that some of it is tangible and can be proven and some of it is, is mystical and no one can explain it. But it's real what comes up in there. And I think because of my propensity to deny and run, I had to be in an altered state of mind to finally face it. And even after I faced it, like my coaches came to talk to me the next day and I'm like, is that my ego? And they're like, oh, <laughs> good job. I'm like, 
good job. Like that ceremony kicked my ass. Like I did not. And there was a three day ceremony. So that was the first one. And I, that is the visual that hit me right out of the gate. And my coach, and this is why coaching, if anybody listening is going to, is considering psychedelics, make sure you have coaches around it because you want to know, like you want that feedback. You want that safety in there of someone who understands it and can tell you what's going on. And so part of why I was able to do it is she said, the plant never gives you anything you can't handle. I love that. It's a, it's a good visual too. Yes. And you know, and that when you have that frame of mind looking into it, even if you're smacked in the face with something awful, like I was, you can say, okay, this was for me. What do I do with this now? And I chose to try to deny it for an extra six months and then got <laughs> smacked in the face with a yeah. relationship that was a mirror of my trauma. And I'm like, all right, I'm listening, oh. I'm listening, I'm listening. Fine, I got it. I got, I got it. it. I got it. You've been I whispering. Was traumatized. It was real. <laughs> Shit. Damn it. <laughs> and we yeah. always hope that, you know, there's a little part in the back of our head that almost kind of doubts that some things have happened to us in our life because some of it's just so incredibly horrible. Like, how did I get through that? put that, push that down as far as I possibly could, not tell anybody about it, including our parents. I know we both had similar experiences until we're in our freaking forties. And now all of a sudden we're finding ourselves like we can't move. We're in wheelchairs. We're ill. We're sick. And we wonder why. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, and it was really easy for me to be like, oh, I was just a bad skydiver. And I was, I was not good at landing. Um, and I had a hundred, but skydiving is one of the things I did to escape myself. And I'm saying that about only myself, no other skydiver. People <laughs> go into skydiving for lots of other reasons. Mine reason, I loved it. It was high risk. I felt like I felt like I was really alive. It burned off all my anxiety. And I don't have depth perception. So I had a really hard time figuring out where the ground went. But if it had just been skydiving, I would have been disabled when I was still jumping, not two years after I hung up my rig. And healing those physical injuries would have given me relief. And that wasn't the case. Like I had healed them, but I was still in excruciating amounts of pain. It wasn't until I started to face my own shit that I actually started to heal. Yeah. Well, and that's the hardest part. And that's the brave part, you know, because we're like, well, we've got to put our big girl panties on. And at some point we have to face the music, you know. And, and, and through this process of doing a, both of our shows, actually, you know, I'm learning so much about my God, I have so much more work to do. I have some every day I'm like, I need, I have more work to do. Like this is basically causing me to do more work on myself, which is awesome because it's also holding me accountable because we're here and I'm like, I have to show up and be there. We both were running, we both sent each other emails, like at the exact same time that we were both running a couple minutes late today. And it was just our universe, like talking to us, you know, thank God you know, the power of what we're doing here is really, really amazing. And finding people like you, it's just, it's just all great. It's so great for us. Yeah. I'm really glad that you had reached out when I started reading about you. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am <laughs> I get to be on this. She is crazy too. <laughs> <laughs> you have a zest for life. And I oh, love that. Thank you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> so after you, once you basically stopped, you know, the skydiving side of your life, that's so interesting that you were doing that to burn off anxiety and stress. And that's just, I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Well, it wasn't recommended as anxiety control. Like my therapist at the time, she's like, that's great that that's a side effect, but I'm, I'm not going to be recommending that to any other clients. Oh my God. She was, she was great. But um, that just, I, I realized that was part of what I was getting out of it. I just love it. I was terrified every time I went up. I was, it, cause, and actually, even though 150 plus jumps sounds like a lot, it's really not. The free fall is 60 seconds only. And then you're under canopy for six or seven minutes. How much are you learning eight minutes at a time? You're not learning a ton. Yeah. Eight minutes at a time. And so it takes a lot of repetition. And, you know, they've got the tunnel and everything for that too, but you can't fly canopy in the tunnel. But there's lots of other ways you can build up your skills. But there's still like this thing that happens in your brain when you're on the edge of the plane and you're looking down, your brain is like, what are you doing? (laughs) No kidding. But then as soon as I was out of the plane, all the anxiety was gone. Huh. There's still some days, like there's certain temperature and dryness in the air. And if I get a whiff of, of, of like, it'll be boat fuel around here, but you know, jet fuel, like if I'm ever near an airport, like I totally get back to skydiving. I start looking in the sky for the skydivers. Like I loved it. 
I was not good at it, but I loved it. <laughs> I was not good. I was not good. <laughs> I really well, at, least you're, at least you're honest with yourself. Hey, we can't be good at any at everything, you know. Oh yeah. my gosh! So okay, so you decide. Okay, it's time to face my traumas, and you start doing these ceremonies. And for our listeners, not everybody knows about what ayahuasca is. So can you give them just a quick little quick tidbit on what that is? Yeah. So there's a class of medicine out there, and the government will have you say that these are awful. They're going to make you go crazy. You're going to lose your mind. You're going to jump off a building. Blah blah blah. It's bullshit. Um, we actually were doing extensive research as a country in the 60s until I think it was the Nixon administration when they decided that drugs were bad. There's a specific class, I totally forget what they're called, called but psychedelics fall under them. And so it's um, LSD, mescaline, ayahuasca, which is DMT, um, psilocybin, and then cannabis can even be considered that as well. So ayahuasca is one of the more intense psychedelics. And there's more, there's actually some that even have a higher psychedelic range. Like there's cambo that you can get from a frog. Um, there's all kinds of different psychedelic medication out there. But ayahuasca, it's a very sacred ceremony. DMT is what they call the spirit molecule. And so at the time that we're born, at the time that we die, the pineal gland in our brain actually releases DMT. Mm. And people can smoke it. Like if they smoke it, you're going to be like a zombie for 20 minutes. I've never smoked it, but I've heard like you, you aren't really moving. You get really deeply intense visual and then it's over pretty quick. I, I haven't done that. So I'm only hearing that secondhand. When you're doing an ayahuasca ceremony, there's, or at least the way I've done it, uh, I've done it two different locations. Both of them have a vow of silence. So you're completely in a meditative state of just you, your journal, your coaches talk to you once a day. And you're there in ceremony circle with other people to take the medicine. And it's very sacred. You set your intent ahead of time and you drink, you know, it's like two ounces or whatever. And then you go into your nest and you're meditating. It's about a four to six hour ceremony. Um, you're eating pretty bland food during ceremony because you want to help keep the, the body clean. And the messages that come in are just absolutely amazing. There's a lot of disbelief around psychedelics, but the thing that has me believing in them and the validity of them. One, I've benefited so much directly. And two is you can actually look up facts you learn in ceremony to validate them. Wow. So one of the first, that actually was the first ceremony when I finally faced the trauma. One of the things she told me was this was part of your endometriosis. So I'd had a hysterectomy in 2015 because I had prolific and severe endometriosis. My doctor said it was actually the worst case of endometriosis she had ever seen. It was everywhere in my abdominal cavity, over both o ovaries, behind my uterus, wow. inside my uterus. My uterus is actually double the size it was supposed to be. I was in excruciating pain and I don't tolerate anything over the counter. I actually don't tolerate any synthetic pain meds. I don't tolerate ibuprofen, naproxen, acetaminophen, opiates make me puke, tramadol makes me suicidal. Yeah. Yeah. So I have yay, very yay big pharma. Woo. Yeah. All the big pharma <laughs> my body, like now that I understand it better, I'm like, oh yeah. That's why I almost jumped off of a roof. That's why. Right. Right. Like it seriously wasn't... causing suicidal thoughts. Like scary stuff has happened to me. And obviously you, it's not from it you is. Know, yeah. Yeah. And they, you know, and that's one of the first things they do when you start presenting with ongoing pain is they give you an antidepressant. It's like, well, why? Well, because we've noticed that if people feel better, they don't have as much pain. It's like, okay, so we're going to numb the emotion instead of like, if I need to feel something to feel better, wouldn't a coach or a therapist be a better recommendation? Then here, yeah. take this pill. Yeah, that or, hey, why don't you just go drink three bottles of wine tonight and we'll see how you feel tomorrow morning, all right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, after all, like one glass of wine is like the gym. So what, four glasses is four workouts? Yeah, great, cool. Yeah, no. no wonder I'm so big and strong. <laughs> <laughs> it's all that wine. That's all the wine lifting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the wine lifting. That's funny. <laughs> but you, so that was one of the facts was that there is this link between endometriosis and early childhood sexual trauma. And you can Google it. And you will find that there is a direct correlation between them. I did not know that going into ceremony. That was something that the plant oh, taught. Oh, wow. Me. Yeah, I, I had no idea that there was any correlation between the two of those because when I went into that ceremony, I was still like trying to repress the trauma. Like I thought the trauma that I had endured had been in recent years with the mistakes I'd made and the people I had let close that, you know, almost wound up 
earning me a felony and a bunch of other stuff, you know, the divorce, all that was pretty rough couple times. So I thought that was what had traumatized me. No, <laughs> that was just more trauma on top, on of, top it. of it. <laughs> the trauma pattern answering it because hurt people hurt people. And when you have a trauma pattern running, you're going to attract other people who have a trauma pattern. That's just the way it is. And it can be this beautiful thing, like you're working through your trauma, Lindsay, and that's probably how we found each other is through that vibration. Where that can be dangerous is if it's someone who's very unhealed and is still in kind of the taking mode of being traumatized, then it can start to get very toxic. It can start to get very, very dangerous for us and hold us instead of allowing us to move forward and bond with other people who are also healing. It's a very different mindset, those who are trapped in trauma and those who want to release it. Absolutely. You, I couldn't have said it any better because it. I see it in a relationship that I've had to let go of that was 25 years long and it was a friendship that was not a friendship anymore. And I had to make that decision. Like I'm on this healing journey on this path and I'm looking at everything and you're one of them. And he ended up being somebody that was a traumatic part of my life that I didn't even really consider that he was. And come to find out, (laughs) I've got even more junk I have to deal with. (laughs) But the first step was was doing the boundary and cutting that person, that toxicity out. I don't want any toxicity in. No more. No more toxicity. We want it all out. Get it all out, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) Yes. 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 And it's time to make ceremony around ourselves and our well-being and our and the rest of our lives because otherwise we're just going to be stuck being miserable and that's no fun because we've we've been there both you and I. Okay, so you've done so you did your ceremony and you found some wonderful lessons from the plant medicine which I I'm so excited to do one and I know you and I are going to talk about it offline but I've been researching them for years and I've just never pulled the plug mostly because of safety issues. And yeah. where that was my biggest concern. I just got the chills. The um the safety issue behind it is like, who's gonna be there with me? Who, you know, I have all these open-ended questions that we don't we don't necessarily know about. And um, I think that's probably a little different for everybody, but I would think, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but I would think that a lot of people that would go into Iwanaska ceremonies like that would have safety issues because they're trying to heal from trauma. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you hear so many horror stories, like people that I know in Cognitive Movement team who they, they've never done psychedelics. They are anti-psychedelic, but they'll never do it because they've seen the downside. Like if you, if you are not properly vetted, if you yeah. have some kind of like someone who has schizophrenia, that's not a good candidate to do mushrooms there are, or psychedelics. Psychedelics are making you go inward. So mm-hmm. you actually can't get addicted to them. Because like it's the stuff that makes you go outward. It's the the cocaine, the methamphetamine, the alcohol. That's an outward focus. And so we're getting out of ourselves. That's what the addictive factor is. It's the escape factor. That's what we get addicted to. When you go inward, like, can you really get addicted to this work? I don't know one person who actually likes the work itself. It's the outcome of the work. The work itself is grueling. <laughs> yeah. to your, your deepest traumas, your hardest feelings, your biggest shames, that is a badass to do that. Anybody doing that, you are a badass. And thank you for doing that work because when you heal, you're helping the whole planet start to raise their vibration for real. There's all these links in science around that. And it's very, very difficult, but the outcome of it is so, so worth it. You have peace, you have harmony, your relationships start to get more harmonious. You know, anything that's off in our life, and I hear this in entrepreneurial presentations, I hear this in pain presentations, you don't have something affecting just one part of your life. You are one person dipping into all these aspects of your life. One thing off is going to have a ripple effect through the rest of your life. So if you're dealing with pain every single day, it is influencing everything you do. For sure. Just understand that. I mean, I don't say that for you to judge yourself and like, hurry up and heal. You're going to heal at your own <laughs> like pace. <a> split. <laughs> if it were that easy, but it, it's not, you know, it's going to be really dictated at the speed of your subconscious. And I had a great conversation actually with someone who's going to be, I was interviewing them on my podcast about how the thing that people in pain want the most is actually the last thing that you're going to get when you're coming out of pain. And I call it the pain journey. When you're coming out of pain, your energy is going to go up. Your mood's going to go up. The last thing that you're going to notice changed is your pain level. 
because your subconscious is holding on to that. And so if you start to think about and kind of reverse engineer it and be like, okay, well, that's, that's screwed up. Like this thing I want the most is going to be the thing I experienced last. Really? <laughs> your subconscious is there to protect you and keep you alive. And pain is there to say, hey, something is wrong. It's a message from your body. It's trying to keep you from doing something that's going to cause you more harm. That's why it's there. Until you understand what that thing is, you can change the perspective, get it out of the body. That pain signal is going to be there. And so it makes sense that your subconscious is going to need to have proof over time that that signal is not needed at the same level and then not at all. And I've experienced this myself too, like a few months after my first cognitive movement session. And that's when I permanently changed my pain state. And I say that I permanently changed it didn't mean that I wasn't still practicing and learning, okay, 40 pound deadlift, not a good idea. You're going to have a few bad back days after that. You know, you still do stupid things because people in chronic pain tend to be pretty freaking strong people from everybody I know. And that also means that we're going to have a tendency to overdo it. <laughs> Which means I've gonna... never overdone anything. Right. <laughs> I overdo everything. What are you talking about? That's exactly. Like, uh, exactly. It's so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> and then the pain spikes again, and then the fear goes with it. Yep. So the fear and the stress are two of the biggest factors I've seen that really influence pain. Because once you've had that big pain spike, your brain can't unlearn that level of pain. And so there's a fear attached to it. You never want to go back there again, ever. Like I still remember when I, after my knee replacement, I'm super flexible. So I was actually able to get around not bending my knee because it hurt so bad to bend it. I couldn't stand it. So that's why I'm stuck in scar tissue. Got stuck twice. But it bent to past 90 degrees within a week of surgery. And I screamed, that is the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. It was like a 20 on a scale of one to 10. It was, um, I, I almost passed out. It was so bad. But my whole nervous system at that point was in this state of perpetual fight or flight because of all the trauma I was inviting into my life, all the toxicity that was in my house. The person I was with and the people who were in my house didn't have my best interest at heart. And I knew that and my body felt it. And it wasn't a safe place for me to be. It wasn't a safe place for me to heal. And guess what? I didn't heal. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that's that's a good point because, you know, we invite these people into our lives and you know, there's a lot of, oh, feeling guilty about having to let some of these people go and get them out of our lives. And I'm dealing with that right now with this friendship that I used to have and that is no longer and him wanting to almost punish me. And there's, I I don't want to get to it because I'll go down a whole complete different (laughs) wormhole on that one, but trying to hurt me now to get me back to being friends doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Like, All you're doing is just perpetuating more toxicity and more hatred and more resentment and more anger instead of going, huh, I wonder why this is happening. Perhaps I should look inward at myself and my own decision making and how it is affecting others in my life. (laughs) Right. But until you're ready, you're not ready. And so unfortunately, those people that aren't ready to start the process, no matter what stage they are in their healing journey, if they're not ready to do it, then, you know, you you can't, it's like the old, you know, adage of you can bring the horse to water, but you can't make him drink, you know? And I'm I'm out of water. I'm done. All of my buckets were empty with that guy. (laughs) It's like, there's no more, there's no more water. (laughs) I'm out and I'm dehydrated. (laughs) Yep. Oh yeah. And it's really hard, especially when it's someone that you really love deeply. Like I'm sure your friend that was around, I'm sure you had a lot of love for him, but absolutely seeing the toxicity, it's like, I, I can't have you in my life anymore unless things are going to be different. And if you know they don't have the capacity, there's no point in even asking. I had something similar. It wasn't as long of a friendship, but it was a close friendship. But they actually opted out of my life. In hindsight, I realized I was kind of pushing them. So I started to heal. It's on. I'm thinking, oh, come with me. Come with me. We can heal. We can heal. And that person wasn't ready to let it go. Yeah. And there's so many reasons why people stay in pain, stay in trauma. One is no one's told you that it has to be any different. Another one is sometimes people are afraid, like, I may not be interesting anymore if this trauma doesn't apply to me anymore. Like, I've seen that repeatedly. So when I first broke through my back pain, I had a panic attack. 
because back pain had become part of my identity and I hadn't, I wasn't realizing it was going to work so well. So I wasn't at all prepared for it to work because I, you've been, well, at that point I was used to, okay, let me try this. Let's have hope. Huh, didn't work. Yeah. So that was the pattern I was used to. And then I was like, holy shit, it worked. And then I was like, huh, holy shit, it worked. And I'm like, what the hell? Why am I freaking out? This is the thing I've wanted. What, what is going on here? And I realized, and I had to take a hard look at myself. I didn't have to be as accountable if I hurt. Oh, interesting. I didn't have to show up as much. I'm using air quotes around that. <laughs> yes, she is. Stay toe to toe with my corporate peers. And I was also in pain and I was a top performer. So there were all these things that I was using. And it, somewhere I had actually decided that I was going to be a better pain expert if I went through more surgeries. Mind you, I've never done well in surgeries, but I'm like, well, if I'm going to have to have a back surgery, I'm going to turn it into something positive. And never had back surgery. I've turned what I did do into something vastly more positive. Um, <laughs> This is, I'm like, there's a couple people that are listening to this right now. I'm one of them, by the way, that just kind of had a little mini aha moment right there about how I hate to use the word leverage, but to a certain extent, it's like, you know what? I don't really feel like doing that. Oh, I love my pain levels too high today, you know? Yeah. And it's not like I'm lying. My pain level is high, but I probably could go out and do that, you know? Sometimes legitimately, we just like don't want to go do something. I mean, that's that's legit. We got to give ourselves those times where, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up about it. But if that turns into an absolute pattern that all of your relationships are tied to the level of your pain and they have to, unfortunately, have to respond around your pain level, that's really unfair to our loved ones because then they're having to like walk on eggshells around us and like, what? God, I don't want to bug her right now because I know that she hurts so bad and, you know even down to people that have their own personal pain that might not be as high as say what mine might be, they'll be like, oh my God, my wrist is just, oh my God, you know, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to complain about pain. I'm like, no, do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. I want to know other people are in pain. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? Like don't feel that guilt and that shame that comes with some of that in our, in our support circles because they're there and they're standing by us, you know, and We've got to remember, we have to remember about them too, but that's, that's for another day. But, you know, and that can also, you actually bring up another great point there and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. This is just what I've seen in the nature of pain. Some of the other aspects that are influencing us that can keep us there. Like your brain literally cannot make the leap to be someone different unless you know who that person is going to be. Your mind is not going to go into the unknown. The only way you can go into the unknown is if you have some kind of evidence that it's going to be safe for you. Otherwise, you're not going to do it. And so you have to have an idea of who you are. So if you take someone who's getting disability insurance, for instance, they may not be able to zero out their pain because they don't want to be dishonest about taking that money. Their pain is real, you know, they, and they were able to reduce it in a session, but there's been so much fear and there's been so much that they have been told, and so many limits put on them that they're going to actually be afraid because they've been told they're going to need this the rest of their life. So they have no ulterior plan yet, no alternate plan whatsoever to say, okay, well, all right, if I'm not on disability insurance anymore, it means I'm not hurting, which means, well, what do I want to do? Like, and if you've never even thought about, well, what do I want to do with my time? And I know a lot of people like, I have no idea. I never even thought I could do something else or that there would be any other option. And so you have to have an idea of this identity that you're going to go to, or you can't shed your current identity of the chronic pain warrior. You can't be the one who mastered chronic pain unless you know what that person's going to look like. Yeah, that's it's like recreating yourself. It's neat and it's scary. I mean, I'm scared because I'm scared of getting better too, to a certain extent, because yeah. part of me is like, well, great, then everything that I've been working towards for like, even just for the, even just the shows, like, well, I guess the show's over, <laughs> you know, like no way it will ever end. I'm never stopping this, but you know what I mean? It's like, that's scary to be like, well, I have the shell of a person that's going to be somebody different than who I am. Like, I love the parts of me that have come out of, I love some of the parts of me that have come out of having what's been, what I've been dealt with, right. Or what I've been dealt and there are some parts of it that make me who I am. And I'm like, well, wait a second. Is that going to go away? Is that part of my personality type going to go away? Is that my bravery and my tenacity and my depravity and, you know, all of that stuff is just going to like lift and I'm not going to be, I'm going to be a shell of another human being. It's scary. 
It is. And it takes time to transform. Like I, I used to call myself a stress and pain management coach. And I realized no one gave a shit about that. <laughs> when we're really talking about transformation. And so I really thought like, what am I actually doing with my clients? I'm transforming. I'm helping them transform, I'm transforming their stress, transforming their pain. And part of that is understanding who you're going to be without it. So that's one of the questions I'm asking my intake is like, what are you going to get back to doing when you don't hurt anymore? Who are you when you don't hurt anymore? No. And sometimes people are like, and I'm, I'm like, I have no idea. And so I like, I remember putting together a bucket list going, I have no idea how the hell I'm going to do this, but this seems like a good idea. And then I'm like, oh, I can go back to my bucket list. You know, oh, and then it got real. Then I was really excited about the bucket list. I'm like, oh, now I can do this. Now this isn't something that I'm just going to have this pile of regrets when I die. Now I can actually go do this. This is awesome. But it takes time. You know, and the other thing that we get to a big degree when we're in pain is we get attention and we get compassion in a world where we are always seeking compassion and we're always seeking empathy because that's what we're hardwired for as humans is to connect. Yeah. is to have something in common. And when someone is hurting, that brings other people to us. Are you okay? They're checking in on us. We're feeling their love. And so especially like coming out of this pandemic where everybody felt isolated for years, we're seeing more and more chronic issues pop up all over the place. All of that isolation did nothing to help anybody's mental state. And that is a huge component in the physical state as well. Yeah, I got worse. I got worse for sure during COVID. Yeah. I mean, 100%. And don't get me started on vaccinations and stuff, but um, <laughs> whole other episode, whole other episode. <laughs> yeah, we're not gonna do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, uh, I definitely that's that's a really good point because that isolation. I mean, we we didn't have the you know we had like a couple people around and that was it. And it was like this is it. <laughs> Yeah, if you even have a couple people around. Yeah, if you do, right? Exactly. I was fortunate enough that my sweetie and I were, you know, we we were glued to the hip and we we made it through. But it was like, you know, there were days that were were a little testy. But big picture, I thought we handled it pretty well, actually. (laughs) But but my pain definitely increased because I wasn't able to go do the bits of things that I can actually go do, and those were gone. And so you know, insert wheelchair. (laughs) <laughs> well, and the extra fear yeah, and the extra stress, all of that is taking a toll on your body. So you have someone who's already in an extra sensitive state because your nervous system's already in a state of fight or flight because you're hurting all the time. And that pain signal is nonstop going through wherever you're hurting in the body, which with you is pretty much everywhere. <laughs> really in my feet and my legs. Yeah. And so, yeah. So it's constantly going to your brain going, I hurt, I hurt, I hurt. Your brain's like, you're right, you're right, you hurt, you hurt. And so it's wearing down your nervous system. So you add extra stress, you add extra fear. And yeah, like you said, and then insert wheelchair because the body just can't handle it anymore. Yeah. But it can be undone. And I'm, and we're going to undo it because that is my goal. And people like you are coming into my world to help with that, which is wonderful. I want to talk about, because you, you quickly just said the word cognitive movement and Nobody knows what that is. <laughs> so I want you to talk about Cogno movement because it's fascinating. <laughs> it is. And I, I actually position this because I've got a bike over there and this is my super high tech soundproofing in here. Uh, so this is a Cogno movement ball. So no one can see the ball, but you can, <laughs> you can go to my website. I think I have a picture of a ball in there somewhere, but it looks like a psychedelic soccer ball. So there's complex geometric shapes and bright colors and that activates the left side of the brain. You see and feel that this is a 3D object. So through a mix of eye movements and body movements, we're actually going to be shifting energy. And so this is a way to be able to access the subconscious mind through a sensation in the physical body. So the way that this starts to happen, and I actually have a freebie I can leave your guests as well. That's this. I did this loom video with this crazy looking stick figure Canva guy. Uh, but I attached a workbook to it as well so that people who are really like, oh, like picking it up as they're watching it, you can just dive in and start taking notes and whatever comes up. So what's happening is your subconscious is constantly monitoring for danger. You know, that's why they say happiness is a choice. You literally have to choose to be happy because your nervous system doesn't give a shit. It has nothing to do with your safety. So it doesn't care. Like it's going to enjoy it when you're in your parasympathetic, you rest and digest like, ah, it's going to enjoy it. But then it's going to be like, wait, wait, there may be another danger. Let's look. (laughs) And if you're in a place of 
perpetual fight or flight, you literally can't sit down. That looks like constantly being on your phone, constantly like, oh, I have a day off. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do oh, this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like that's when you know you've got perpetual fight or flight going. And that was me for the longest time. It was, you know, almost felt like it's like grab my arm and pull me out of the skies to get me to meditate at first. Like I just didn't want to sit down. But what's happening is so you'll be going along and your subconscious is taking and I've, I've heard a bunch of different stats, but it's running 90 to 95 percent of the show. The conscious mind is doing about five to 10 percent. So the only problem with that is we think that what we have in our conscious mind is actually like the whole truth. And we don't go deeper beneath the surface to be like, what else is there? What is, else is attached to it? And so we're going along and then there's going to be a sensation that starts to come up in the body that's actually attached to some sort of emotion. As that gets more and more prominent, that's going to turn into a thought in the conscious mind, something like, oh, I can't pay my mortgage this month. Inflation rate's too high. Something like that. I always use the money example because I think that's one everybody's dealt with and with inflation and the prices of everything right now, everybody's really relating to this. Yeah, no kidding. And what we tend to think is, oh, I had this thought and then I feel it. You're actually feeling it before you think it. And then once the mind, the conscious mind is taken off, then we start to get into this loop, this calibrated loop. And we're actually staying, we're going to make the feeling bigger in the body because we keep going, oh my God, you're right. How the hell am I ever going to pay my bills again? I, I'm not making enough money. I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not this. And you're finding all the reasons to stay in the solution. And then the next thing you know, you've got a full-blown anxiety attack. And so that, and that's the way it starts going in the in the body. And that's with anything. It can be in a shame pattern. It can be in anger, you know, a great way to notice that you're in anger. If like Fox News suddenly seems appealing to you, or if someone puts a polarizing threat out there, a polarizing post, I, you know, no, no, <laughs> I probably shouldn't pick on Fox News so much, but oh my gosh, my mom watches it all the time. And my I mom can't does too. Listen, like, they're so angry. They're I know. All so they're angry so angry. angry. I know. They're, so angry. they're not angry on MSNBC <laughs> too. They're angry on all the news channels. But I just, I can't. But, you know, if you're, if you see a social post out there and it pisses you off and you find yourself writing back and commenting on that post, you have got some anger going in there. And so I've, the way that I like to work with clients is I've developed this system that I call the pain changer system. And we look through life through four areas of impact. So we're looking at what are the words that are coming out of your mouth? You know, if you're, if you're angry, you're not going to be like, oh, honey, I love you. You're going to be like, fuck you. You're not going to be happy. You're going to be moving things like that. You're going to be throwing things around, slamming doors. You're going to be able to see that you're angry in there. What is the effect that it's having on your mental state? What else is going on in there? So the four areas of verbal, emotional, mental, physical. So if we say, okay, we're looking at the emotion of anger. I see it in my words here. This is how I feel mentally. These are the things that may be contributing to it. In my physical environment, I can see that these things are going on, or there may be something in the physical environment that adds to the anger, maybe people who are around you or something, but there's different things that are feeding in there. And so you can actually use the four areas of impact to figure out what those subconscious patterns are that are running and what else you need. You know, you're not going to be able to get into that calm meditative state if you don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So, and that is one of the biggest reasons I see people in this perpetual fight or flight. It comes from trauma. We see it with police officers. We see it with other first responders. We see it with people in chronic pain. We see it with people who come back from war, veterans. All of those things can start to get you into a state of perpetual fight or flight. If you aren't doing something to downregulate the nervous system, it's going to turn into pain. The only way out of pain is going through it and feeling everything that your body has for you to feel and you don't get a choice of what's in there. I've tried that. That doesn't work. <laughs> it's whatever is in there is going to come up and you're going to feel it. And so with Cogno movement, we're going to be focusing on that feeling that sparked that thought soundtrack in your head. Okay. And we're feeling that with everything in our body. And so you're focusing 95 to 99% of your attention on that. So as you're focusing on that, that cross body is going to start to move information between the two hemispheres of the brain. So psychedelics have a similar effect. Cognitive movement is actually like manually pushing it back and forth. When you're on psychedelics, there's a great documentary on Netflix called The Mind Explained. And they had an episode that talked about psychedelics. And you see one picture of the brain and it's just left side's talking the left side, right side's talking the right side. And then you see a picture of a brain on psychedelics and everything's talking to everybody else. Like there's this 
all these different thought lines lit up that you don't see. And that's how you get those different perspectives. And cognitive movement does it manually in a sober state of mind. So there's use cases for both of them. Definitely. Like I know a lot of addicts who never want to alter their state of mind again. That's part of staying in recovery. Cognitive movement is a much better option for them because psychedelics, that scares them or they they just, that is what they have said. And like, I'm not taking another mind altering substance for the rest of my life. So it doesn't matter whether it has an addictive tendency or not. That's a commitment they made to themselves. Yeah. But as we start to get in there, we're going to start to break apart that pattern, start to make sense of it. You know, the story starts to come out of, oh, maybe, maybe it wasn't that bad. You know, maybe not getting a popsicle that time wasn't the end of the world. Oh, hey, I was actually okay. And wow, I didn't let myself feel all of these things. This is how I felt at the time. I wish I had said that. And it all starts to come up because you're tapping into the subconscious mind. And so you're, you're getting the story out of the way. You're focusing on the feeling in the body and you can actually feel it start to diminish. Usually in the same session, we would, we check in, I check in after every round. Hmm. And so we do, um, it's usually one, we call it an up the body. So it's doing a cross body. And then the eye movements we do are very similar to EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization and reprogramming. And so I'm not an EMDR specialist, but anecdotally, I've heard it's like EMDR on crack. It's just really <laughs> effective. Well said. So, yeah, I, I'm quoting someone else. I don't remember who, but it, that wasn't mine. So how is that in comparison to other pain treatments? I mean, it's it, because it's working at the subconscious level. That's why it's so powerful. It is. And so it's, there is, so I've talked to people who do pain reprocessing theory and there's similar principles. There's similar principles with any of the modalities. Same thing with EFT. There's a lot of similar principles in there. And we even do a little bit of tapping in cognitive movement. And since doing an eight week session with Lauren Fonville, one of your other guests, um, I've actually integrated more tapping into my sessions too. If the emotion is really high, just to help lower it and make it easier to sit with as we're doing the session. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that subconscious mind in there. And it also starts to tap into the body's innate ability to heal the innate wisdom we all have within us. So as that trauma is getting out of the way, you're actually raising the functioning, the, 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 the amount that your body can function, its ability to function is going to be raised as you're doing this because the trauma and the things that are damaging your body are getting out. Hmm. How long is each session? And can you, I mean, I'm assuming you can do it virtually because I'm the, the, I mean, the ball's right there in front of my face. And as soon as you start playing with it, that's all I'm looking at, not you anymore, but you're too <laughs> cute. You're too cute. Stop covering your face up with this ball. But um, so how long does each session last and how many sessions does an average chronic pain person or somebody that's been through trauma, because not all trauma means that you live in chronic pain, you know, right. but you are, right. pain is pain is pain. And I always say that because it might be, it, we could have the same exact thing happened to our body and our body responds completely different from it. Yep. And somebody might not have any pain from breaking their leg after it's healed. The other person, they feel it every time it rains. It's hard to walk. They use a cane, whatever it might be. So generally speaking, how many sessions does it take for people to start really starting to feel a difference? So you can feel a difference in one session. And, it's, and I like to do three to six months commitments because it's going to take time until you really start to see a difference. Like I said at the beginning, the last thing that's going to change is your actual state of pain. Right. And so I was working with someone who had fibromyalgia. We did 10 sessions together and she was able, she actually stopped, started to forget to take one of her pain pill doses because she didn't need it. That's great. She didn't even consciously stop it. She was just like, oh, I hadn't needed it. And she didn't realize it because again, you're, and that's the other thing is you don't even notice as the pain is going down. And so I very clear on the forms and the intake is like, what is your pain level now? Because you're not going to remember it later down the road. You're going to remember that you hurt, but your brain's going to try to play tricks on you the whole time. Be like, now you still hurt. You still hurt. You still hurt. And you actually have to have that other lens to be like, well, Wait a second. You couldn't do that when we yeah, first start working together. I just together finished a whole walk with my dogs that I haven't been able to do in five years. Like, wait. Right. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. of a sudden, just something pops up like that. I mean, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. So three to six months and everybody's different. Right. Because I love that we find that we are finding some some hope at the end of our rope, you know, because it's just like, what, hope on the end of my rope? That's good, Lindsay. Yeah, I like that Trademark one. that. <laughs> we should. The, um, you know, I just, 
I, I feel so horribly for all of us that, have, that live in pain and have been through so many, you know, so many horrible things in life. And to be able to find people that A, like yourself, that want to work with people that can also be empathetic and sympathetic about it, you know? Yeah. So, well, this cognitive movement thing is really, really cool. It's, it's, it, I, I definitely, I'm going to be look, talking to you more about it because I, it sounds like it's a good therapy tool for somebody like me who's super visual. Do you find that that's the case where if you have more creative, more visual people that, that do better on it per se? Or is it just no? <laughs> more open-minded. So mm. the, the left brain engineers, like, and it's funny, so I can see a lot in the eyes, right? And so the amount that we can actually smoothly move our eyes is actually correlated to how open our minds are. And so you're, you're, you start to expand your vision because you're doing the eye movement so much, you're actually starting to expand your vision a little bit more. And so what I found with engineers and people who are really left brain is I try to like, when your eyes are up, you get into ideas and inspiration and they'll just like, there's all sorts of weird stuff going on or like over on the right hand side, they just can't be in their right brain. And so, and there's, there's this shut downness. Mm-hmm. And trying to get them to feel something in the body and hold on to it, like they want to make sense of it. And it's like this isn't your your logical mind isn't in here. It's going to get a vote when the ball goes by it, but this is not your logical mind that's in here. You're going to have to tuck that away in your back pocket for a minute. Um, but I've learned how to get around those people too. It's it's you aren't doing as you're still in the feelings, but there's different techniques to be able to come in around one angle or another. Um, the, those who good visualization, it makes it a lot more fun and you're going to have more access. And well, it, I'm, it, I'm happy yeah. about that. <laughs> this is anything. It's, it's amazing. What happens is you start to, to move this energy around. And as you start to raise your vibrational level and you start to get rid of the fear programming, the pain, all of the emotions that are part of it too, your your consciousness goes up, your awareness goes up, you start to feel more connected to source, God, universe, whatever you want to call it. I started to say there's actually five areas of impact. The fifth one overlies them all, and that's the spirituality. And what I'm seeing is the more you do this work, the more connected to source, God, universe, I like to say universe, you feel more and more connected. You feel more in alignment. You get more evidence that we're all one. And you start to see this, and it starts to become this undeniable thing. And I'm not trying to push faith on anybody of any, but I've just seen this over and over again, not just with myself, but with other people. Like I've seen people go from being atheists to be like, huh, there is something out there. Yeah. And like, and my coach Shannon likes to joke that um, you may come into ayahuasca being an atheist, but you don't leave an atheist. Like, cause there's just, there is a component to it. That's almost magical. It's mystical. It, it can't fully be explained by science, but it is absolutely phenomenal when it's in the right setting with good coaches who can help be in it with you, help you prepare and vet you out that you are a proper candidate ahead of time. So it is absolutely safe. It is a beautiful experience. You feel fully supported and you will get about 10 years of therapy in three days doing an ayahuasca ceremony. It's, I'm, I'm just, I can't, I can't even wait to do it. Okay, so before we, we check out of here, um, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Um, possibility starts with you. And if you are listening to doctors who tell you that you can't and tell you you shouldn't and all that shit, maybe go find a doctor that has more of an open mind and vet out that doctor because you are going to be the one that is in charge of your prognosis, not the doctor. It is up to you what you feel you are capable of much more than any doctor. So don't let a doctor limit you because if I had listened to my doctors, I would have had three surgeries. There you go. Yep. I did not have any of those. I had other surgeries, but I was told I was going to need one to fix my neck, one to fix my back, and one to fix the scar tissue on my knee. And... I, there's still a little bit of bend that I can't do with the right leg, but the only time it gets in my way is when I try to go into child's pose and yoga. Yeah. And which that's, is a t- that's a tough one on your knee. On my list yeah. <laughs> to care about. I'm getting surgery because I can't do child's pose anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's, 
That's no. a silly reason, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> no, no, especially not when you're told that getting the scar tissue out is going to be like having the knee plate replacement all over again. Yeah. Like when they told me that, that's when I went back to my house and, and found Shannon. I'm like, I can't. I can't. There has to be, there has to be something other than traditional medicine. Yes. I'm 43 years old. Every ounce of me is screaming in pain. And every time I go to the doctor is worse. Like this. Yep. I've got to give. Something's and gotta it give. I started facing my shit and started to open my mind to what was possible. And also just one more note to the listeners. Don't judge yourself for whatever you're going through right now. It's just going to make it worse. Give yourself grace. If you can't do something one day, you can't do something one day. Try it again the next day. And anytime you can do something, celebrate it. Because then you're going to start to look for more that you can do. I love that so very much. And she does have her own podcast as well called the Pain Changer Podcast, which is interesting because I'm the pain game and she's the pain changer. And where else can we find you and learn more about Cogno Movement? Yep. So you can go to katierigley.com. That's K-A-T-I-E-W-R-I-G-L-E-Y. And you can also find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook at Coach KT Dubs. So that's C-O-A-C-H-K-T-D-U-B-S. I love it. Thank you so much for your time with us today. This has been a blast. <laughs> uh, thank you too, Lindsay. It's been awesome being on here. Thank you so much. You are exclusively invited to share this VIP pain journey together. Let's get to the heart of how to heal with you by my side. Please follow the Pain Game Podcast wherever you digest your podcast content. We will be there. Visit us at thepaingamepodcast.com and follow us on all the socials. Thanks for listening, my little VIPs. Catch you on the other side.